Tommy, good morning to you. Good morning, bud. What are you doing? I am great, and we have a lot to talk about. Damn good dynamite last night, and there's a lot to talk about. I'm looking forward to talking about it with you for the next three hours. And, of course, the Busted Open Nation. Uh, I would agree. I loved Dynamite last night. And if you wanted to pick apart a show or just say a lot of negative stuff about AEW, you're just an AEW hater. And uh, don't listen. How about that? Because oh, there wait, was nothing really Tommy, to pick apart. Interesting, Tommy, that you said that because I, I'm going to agree with you on this one. Like, you know, a lot of times we are critical about AEW, but if you're critical or overly critical – of a show like the one that we got last night, then I think you're probably just an AEW hater because there was a lot to love about dynamite last night. Yeah. You just don't like the show. So it's like, yeah, they're not going to do anything last night on paper. Right. Uh, we broke down the show, how it's going to be, man, this show's going to look long. What does Tony Khan go out there and do? He literally announces to the world. I've spoke with the network direct, uh, the heads of the network, we're extending our time, which is wonderful, right? So right then and there, I'm like, huh, what's in store? No, hey, I got a big surprise. No, nothing. And the show kicked off great, ended great. There was, it, it, there's a lot of really, really good. Like I said, there was a lot of stuff last week to set up. I felt the entire wrestling industry did stuff to set up this week. And Dynamite really delivered with a lot of things and more to come. Um, uh, th where do you want to start? Because there's a lot to get into. I guess we have to start with how that show ended. You said it on the show yesterday about Eddie Kingston. That you said, man, I, I can't see Eddie Kingston being ready for the match at Double or Nothing. And you're right. Eddie Kingston, we heard, was out. And there was going to be a spot to fill and then we found out after that main event last night that, I mean, I guess you could call this guy Superman. You know, we kind of mockingly said that Orange Cassidy is like Superman. But Darby Allen is like, I guess, maybe like the $6 million man. I mean, a guy a month and a half ago breaks his foot. What, two weeks ago gets hit by a bus. And now he's going to be in that match at Double or Nothing. Darby Allen is back, and that was a pretty cool moment to end that show last night. Totally shocked. If you also think about uh, what I thought they did great, they have great Washington State representation. I want to say more so than most wrestling companies in the sense of they have Swerve Strickland, they have Brian Danielson, and like, Aubrey's from there and um, Darby Allen. I mean, those are some of your heavy hitters minus yep. uh, Aubrey um, as, you know, nice surprises slash hometown representation of main characters, which is always key. And to figure, I actually forgot about Darby. And I said yesterday on the show, man, all you got to do is look within your roster and see who's going to be part of Team AEW. And how it was set up, uh, the firing of Chris Daniels with you know by the Young Bucks, um, didn't feel they needed to go super heavy on the talent relations side of what uh, Christopher Daniels did, because I don't think a lot of the home audience or wrestling fans knew that Christopher Daniels worked behind the scenes uh, for all these years. But just firing him as a wrestler... Or saying, hey, you're a 54-year-old wrestler. Good luck trying to find a job out there in that market. Like, that is something I would have leaned into just a little bit more. But the the snarky asshole bosses that continue with Nicholas and Matthew um, was a thread throughout the show, like it should be, piling heat on them. And then once there's more heat after, here came a nice surprise and... Listen, man, that that building popped big for him. I popped big for him. I'm just happy to see his return. Like you said, he there's a lot of people in wrestling who could take a lot of physical abuse. Uh, Cactus Jack, Sabu, Darby Allen, uh, there, 
part of uh, Sandman, Tommy Dreamer, Dusty Rhodes, the ability to take the abuse for the fans. And, you know, a lot of people would say, hey, you're being wheel wheelchairs. Hey, why do you do this to your body? What happened to Darby really wasn't uh, happened to him in the wrestling ring. His foot, yes, he did break it. But, I mean, getting hit by a bus is rough. Um, <laughs> you think? <laughs> I've gotten hit by a bus. I got thrown into a bus. So I could probably be one of the few people who could relate to it. And I didn't get sideswiped. I told a guy to throw me into a bus. And I couldn't believe how I went flying off of that bus in Queens Boulevard. Stupidest thing ever, because I could have went under the tires a bit dead. Um, but for Darby, you know, I know, listen, driving in New York City or walking in New York City is so hard to navigate. I have to do it on a regular um, between I, I call it Grand Theft Auto, where I'm driving or I play football, where I'm looking for my holes if I'm a running back to before I get hit and you got to, I mean, people on bikes, pedestrians, cars, it's insane. And for the fact that he, like, cause people are like, how do you get hit by a bus? So, so easy. Um, I've almost been hit by two mopeds many times in the city, just crossing the street. Cause you look to the left, you look to the right. And all of a sudden someone just barreling in, yep. I will so rush and sickle somebody off their bike. <laughs> never hit me by the way, just straight up. Um, Darby, you know, we used to say like Sabu had uh, pigeon bones because like how his ability to absorb these, you know, punishment. And I saw him take so much punishment. And I was like, man, how is this guy walking um, for Darby, too? He's one of those anomalies um, that he puts his body on the line. Jeff Hardy's another guy who goes out there and does it like that <clears throat> and, you know, um, has made a lot of money doing so. Uh, the daredevil wrestler um, loved his return, loved him being on team AEW. You no, know, Dave, we talked a lot about pillars for a long time. Some of the, it's literally, if not so much a pillar, an OG, uh, yeah. an AEW original and getting the fans to rally. Even, you know, I loved at the end where Matt, Matthew Jackson was like saying goodbye to the crowd and he was like, okay, guys, AEW, AEW. Like, <laughs> it was so great until you got a real organic, oh, my God, I can't believe he's here. Really, um, I I enjoyed the last night's. Anytime you give me a surprise, and I think AEW has learned from, we got a big surprise, we have a big, yeah. big announcement. They're learning from their mistakes that I don't want to say backfired on them. It's just it's hard to live up. To those expectations again going back to what i know best for so long in ecw where the lights on lights off things started fans got accustomed to it and then once we stopped doing it it because it was like how do you keep popping it how do you keep topping it and you couldn't so then you have to back off of it Be but when you get a nice surprise especially one of your own in your hometown. It's like, you know what? I paid to see a wrestling show and I got the return of my hometown guy, Darby Allen. Great. For me last night, I got to watch two plus hours of a really good wrestling show. And I got to see somebody that I like to watch perform. And I was like, good for this show and getting me behind, uh, you know, AEW. I th overall, like I said, if you did not like that show last night, then you're just not going to like AEW. But yeah. it was a really good wrestling show on paper. Like I could be like, all right, I know who's going to win, who's going to lose. I really could if I looked down the entire thing. But where they went with all those matches, also solid matches, like straight up really good wrestling matches. And there's nothing wrong with a really good wrestling matches on a pro wrestling show, just like. Uh, Sundays when I will sit by and, you know, the, the giants are going to play at four, the jets aren't playing, but they're going to show two teams go at it that I particularly don't care about. They're going to have the Falcons versus the Panthers. And I'm going to sit and watch every down of that game. And if it's a good game, I'm going to start looking at my clock and be like, man, I don't want to switch the channel at four because this game's really good. So uh, that's what I kind of equate last night's show to.
especially a game that might have playoff implications. And I feel like when you're, this close, yeah. <laughs> when you're this close to a pay-per-view like AEW is, next weekend is double or nothing. Everything's going to have implications to it. And I agree with you. Yes, you can look at the card last night and say, all right, I can, I can tell who is most likely going to win these matches. But usually that is the case with television matches because they're building towards the pay-per-view. They're telling a story. Bully said something, and I, and I can understand where he was coming from when he made this statement yesterday, but at the same time, you got to change your mindset. Bully said on the show yesterday that it's hard for him to follow the stories because he has been programmed by AEW to watch it without any storytelling. You know, he said something along those lines. I'm, I'm kind of thumbnailing it here. But I feel like now, Tommy, you have to get used to the fact that AEW is giving you stories. They're giving you stories now with the Elite. They're giving you a story now with Swerve, your world champion. They're giving you a story with Chris Jericho. And obviously, they're telling a really good story with Willow Nightingale and Mercedes. And I'm just scratching the surface here. But that's four different stories that you saw play out on the show last night. So I think you really have to start thinking about, like you said, Tommy, that maybe, hey, we call it constructive criticism. A lot of people have been very, very critical about Tony Khan and his booking methods and very critical about AEW. Well, if you're going to be critical, when they start to do the things that people are critical about the product about, and they start changing, then you got to give them praise when they're doing that too. And I believe over the course of the last couple weeks, and it's not going to happen overnight, Tommy, but you're starting to see a lot more storytelling with AEW. Another thing that they have done a good job with, and I think last night was an example of it, Tommy, is they're slowing the pace down. It doesn't feel like they're rushing through things like they used to do. I think you're 100% right. Early on, People were excited about AEW. Lights would go out. Oh, my God, when the lights go on, who is it going to be? Who's this former WWE superstar that's going to be in the ring? Is it going to be Brian Danielson? Is it going to be Adam Cole? Is it going to be CM Punk? Well, they've gone through all those shocks and surprises. And like you said, Tommy, they probably ran it dry to the point where you were sick of it. But now they're using their roster. They're using it the right way. And they're starting to tell stories. I really feel like a lot of the AEW naysayers, and I count myself as one of the pre- people that have been very critical of AEW over the last year. I think you got to start changing how you're viewing this show now because they are starting to slow things down and they are starting to tell stories. Uh, if you look at history, right? WCW, here comes Hall, here comes Nash, here comes Hulk. Um, then, you know, eventually it was X-Pac. There was a lot of people during this free agency time period where they're jumping ship left and right. Then, you know, after a while, it's like, what's he doing here? It's Barry Darso. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Just good to see him. But yeah. l- unless you could keep to- topping it. And that was, I mean, stuff that you saw, or, hey, who's just joined the NWO this week? Who cares? Because there's 70 of you. Um, AEW has done a lot of really, really good in the last few weeks. And if you talk about long-term stories, this, you know, the TK driver started it uh, with that storyline. Adam Copeland's with the House of Black started it. Swerve Strickland, a different path. Uh, with him as just being straight up babyface, where you and I were like, well, what is he? Is he a heel? He's a babyface. This guy's a straight up babyface in his hometown yep. and gets his ass kicked and then has a, now a personal issue laid out bloody in front of his you know hometown by this psychopath uh, Christian Cage. Um, you know, Orange Cassidy's with the, the best friend stuff. Um Willow and Mercedes, which we will get into, um, which was fabulous. Hook's return, Hook and Jericho, the other story with Samoa Joe. So there is webs being weaved throughout all of this. 
um, show. And, you know, it, it's, it's was really good television last night. And, and listen, not everything I could tell you from my own experience on my own shows, when I used to go back and watch them, I'm like, you know what? I could have done better on this. Or, you know what? That wasn't what I had envisioned. Or, damn, why did this match go so long? There's all these, like, and these are on my own shows that I would have 100% creative control on. And then it's just like, damn, I wish that would have happened. It doesn't. Um, writing weekly episodic television is very, very hard. Also, when you have other people chiming in, you know, eventually, yes, you do need that boss. It was, you know, in WWE, it's Triple H. Before him, it was Vince McMahon. And at times, like, Vince would change his mind for what the writers would lay out. Writers get a lot of heat that's not really their fault because, and, and I've discussed this process, you could write the best show and then it gets chopped up by an agent. It gets chopped up by a talent uh, that tries to go and change something. It gets chopped up by your boss. You have production meetings that sometimes, like, you know, it was the first time these people are hearing this show and then they're adding their tidbits and like, okay, well, you asked me to be the creative person, but I'm getting to go to here and these little changes, tweaks and all that stuff are going to mess up to where I want to go. So that's why your presentation of what you have isn't what you truly wanted or, Hey, somebody goes over on time and then I got to have this one hell of a banger of a match. That's going to go 20 minutes. It has to go 10. So, or, you know, I mean, those things always happen, especially on live television. Last night's show, the return of Darby Allen, the crowd was happy. And then even, you know, I'm starting right after that show went off the air. I was like, man, that was so good. Um, and then I went to social media for, I went to go, oh, I went to see what we posted and then what Bully was talking about, just so I could have some, you know, my own, I already always know my own, what I want to talk about. And then I'm hearing like post-match stuff. And I was like, ooh, I want to invest more in this. Uh, because I was like, I didn't even know Darby be cleared. And if the guy is walking with a limp and all that stuff, even better because he's going in battle hurt, which gets you more sympathy as well as, I mean, I know AEW is not going to let a person who's not medically cleared to perform, but it puts sympathy on your baby face. Or also if, you know, when we had discussed where can they go from there, right? There is your, your kryptonite for your team. You got a banged up guy, go after him. Win that match, use him, screw him, and further your story of this dominant reign of your new controlling bosses. And again, the thread throughout. But listen, I could not believe the pouring of an energy drink on Tony Schiavone got the reaction that it did. Like, it was like, oh, I couldn't believe, like, you did that. And I was like, really? Like, that got that such a reaction? But they really like Tony Schiavone. And it's like Jack Perry, like, hey, you're such an asshole, as opposed to throwing hot coffee in someone's face or just the way he did it garnered such a heel reaction, which was great, which is mean they don't like Jack Perry. Yeah. And, and, and again, I know a lot of AEW fans got on me, Tommy, about the fact that you and I especially would come on the air on a Thursday and say it's hard when you don't have defined baby faces or heels. And AEW fans would say to me, well, we don't like to be force-fed who to like and who not to like. We want to decide who we like. Yeah, but then if you do that, you get a lot of confusion and you don't get the reactions that you want when it comes to stories and when it comes to matches. Now you're seeing those defined baby faces and heels, and it's, and it's, making, it's making complete sense to me now why you need to have those things. And I think it's making sense to the audience and it makes it easier to tell stories. And now with AEW, you said it, we had a thread throughout with the elite. You have stories, you had great matches, you had a hot crowd, you had a big surprise at the end. I mean, that was as near a perfect show from AEW that we've gotten in a long time.